Welcome everyone to Low Connects. We're so excited for Dwayne Speaks. Um, I'm Jody Seifer. I'm the Curator of Education at the Low, and we're so glad that you've joined us tonight. We are, of course, recording this um, program, so you should be able to watch it very shortly after tomorrow, the next day on the Lowe's YouTube channel, so you can look out for that. I'm just going to give a quick intro and then we will get right to the main event. Um, so we would like to thank the organizations that have supported this program, um, especially the Arnold and Augusta Newman Foundation. This is part of our endowed um, legendary lecture series in photography of which we are so grateful to have Mr. Michaels back for the second time, because we love him that much. Um, we would also like to thank the Miami-Dade County Department of Cultural Affairs and the Cultural Affairs Council, the Miami-Dade Mayor and Board of Commissioner, the State of Florida Department of State, Division of Cultural Affairs, and the Florida Council on the Arts and Culture and the City of Coral Gables. Um, I would also like to thank, of course, Mr. Michaels and Josiah Cunio um, in Twain Michael studio, as well as the entire low staff who all had a part in creating tonight's event. Um, if you need a closed captioning, you can turn on the live transcript if you click the little um, CC box on your Zoom menu bar. Uh, we hope that you will do that if you need to. Also, during the program at any time, please type in your questions for Q in the Q&A feature. You can find that by clicking the Q box that says Q&A. And then we'll have a presentation and then afterwards we'll take your questions. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. At the end, please look out for a survey when you sign off. Um, it'll pop up. Um, we really appreciate if you take a few moments to answer your, a survey about how tonight's program was for you. Um, it helps the low with their grant support and um, we really do read them. So we appreciate that. Um, please save the date for our next Low Connects. Next month, it's October 28th at 5.30 p.m. We'll have Gary Milchers, American Master, presented by Joanna Catron. She's the curator of the Gary Melcher's home and studio at the University of Mary Washington. This is in preview in um, it's a preview for our exhibition, which will be on view November 18th, An American Master at Home and Abroad, Gary Melcher's 1860 to 1932. You can register for that um, like you registered for tonight's program um, on our website, low.miami.edu. Um, where you can find it'll be in this corner after tonight and you can also register for all of our other upcoming virtual programs as well so without further ado i'm just going to read a short short version of mr michael's bio because it's got a he's got a really long bio and a, a lot of things going on but you can, we want to get to him so i really want to thank Mr. Michaels, again, for you being here with us again. I wish it could have been in person again, and this had been, has been delayed quite a few times due to the situation. So um, Dwayne Michaels was born in 1932 in McKeesport, Pennsylvania, and he's one of, the greatest, one of the great photographic innovators of the last century, widely known for his work in series, multiple exposures, and text. Over the past five decades, his work has been exhibited in, in the US and abroad, including um, the Museum of Modern Art, which hosted his first solo exhibition in 1970. In 2019, the Morgan Library and Museum in New York exhibited a career retrospective of Michael's work, The Illusions of the Photographer, Dwayne Michaels at the Morgan. In 2008, Michael celebrated his 50th anniversary as the photographer with a retrospective exhibition at the Thessaloniki Museum of Photography in Greece and the Scavi Scaligeri in Verona, Italy. He has a BA from the University of Denver in 1953, and he worked as a graphic designer until his involvement with photography deepened in the late 1950s. He currently lives in and works in New York City. 
So please, let's turn it over and welcome virtual applause for Mr. Dwayne Michaels. So we need to unmute, yes, we need to unmute you, um, Mr. Michaels. Call me Joe. Or you there you go. Hello. Will you call me for dinner? <laughs> I just said that. Okay. Can I go now? Yes, you're on now. <laughs> oh, no, can I go now? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ask me a hard one. Ask you a hard one right off the bat? Yeah. All right. Right off the bat. So I'm wondering, I'm going to show some images. So this is the sure. first one in your slides. So yeah. I'm assuming they're in order, right? Yeah. This this is a picture I took at Stillman's gym uh, when I after I got out of the army in 1955. Um, I think it was 55, 50. Anyway, uh, I went to Parsons for a year and I dropped out because I it was a waste of time. And we had an assignment. We had a photo class and uh, I borrowed a camera and this is from the first shooting I ever did. And uh, I found out I was a natural. And I beat the shit out of him. I'm a really good boxer too. You know, see, see how frightened he is when I took that picture? He looks terrified. I have oh, to tell terrified. you, I went to Parsons and I went through the whole thing. So I feel oh. you on that. Yeah, <laughs> you were okay. smarter yeah. than I am. Yeah, I'm, I'm a dropout. You photographed a lot of boxers, haven't you? No, no, uh, uh, no, this was just, I went, no, hardly as a matter of fact, it's the only boxer because uh, uh, I find them intimidating, but I like the look in his face. That's a pure accident, that look. I never assume I, oh, and I like the way I, the, the light overexposed his, uh, his sweatshirt. I thought it was really terrific. And I use that a lot. I, I've learned everything on the job and this may have been the first time I did the overexposure. Really, that's so interesting. Underexposure, over. Am I over or underexposed? Oh, I'm exposed. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Don't expose yourself. We've had that happen on Zoom meetings early on, so we don't need that again. <laughs> that's, I think that's funny. I like funny. Okay, let's go on. Me too. And then in 1958, I borrowed an Argus C3 and I went to Russia. I was working at Time Inc. doing promotion for Sports Illustrated and all those magazines, and I found out you could go, and it was a the trip changed my life. I was 26 and I said I was going to go and my friend said, you, you're, going, you're not going to go. I said, fuck you, I am going. And I went. And if I hadn't gone, I'd start, I'll probably do, be doing, still modeling for porn. Yeah, I was I've a heard that. Yeah, <laughs> I was very famous, yeah. So I, I find this really interesting. You know, we have the exhibition at the low, Dwayne Michaels, the portraitist, which I really love. And this is one of we have, I think there's two photos from Russia included in that exhibition, and this is one of them. So I'm wondering, you know, what it is, what is it about this one in particular? Out of, I imagine you took lots of photographs there when, on your trip. What well, is I, it I, yeah. about this one that you love? This one is absolutely perfect. First of all, they're probably they're probably in their 80s or 90s now, and uh, they have no idea that this moment, this decisive moment. Uh, it still exists. And uh, I like to know this, their stories, but the composition in my mind is absolutely perfect. I like all this series of semicircles, her shoulders, the little white collars, the, the glasses. It, it, it's a lovely, lovely picture. Yeah, and then there's a reflection in her glasses as yes, well. Which... That makes it even more interesting. And then you get the little white thing up in a corner. Yeah. <laughs> And this one is one that's in the uh, not in the exhibition, but it's one that you chosen from the trip as well. Yeah, I, well, I told a story. I, every week I send out an email. What's our email call so people can see it? Uh, Instagram. It's on Instagram, the Dwayne Michaels, and uh, I do a little. I do a lot of moving. Every week I do something different. And I told I did a thing on Russia recently about the trip, and uh, this is. I, it was a Monday morning. I was my first morning in in uh, Leningrad, wandering around, and then this little boy started to follow me. I was so paranoid. I figured he must have been an NKVD agent dressed up as a midget. And uh, and then I would go block, and he would he would go block. Then I stopped, and and he came up to me, and he put his hand out, and he gave me a little red pin in the palm of my hand, a red star. 
And uh, as he walked away, he looked back and that's when I took this picture. It was a very sweet moment. That sounds like a really sweet moment and that you remember him so well. And I have this picture and he's probably 89 by now, but look at the, uh, the car and the lady, everything is absolutely uh, right. So I have a, I'm a natural, you know, the way some people are naturals is uh, whatever, but I'm a natural photographer. Yeah, well, it reminds me of a Cartier-Bresson, and I know you've mentioned him before, but is he someone that you admire or not? Yes, yes, he's great. They're, Cartier-Bresson and Robert Frank are the two great, greatest reportage photographers. Uh, Gary Winogrand was a snap shooter. He, he was a creation of John Zarkowski's imagination, but you can't, nobody could beat these two. Yeah, I agree. But did you know about Brisson when you went to Russia? Oh, of course. I mean, yeah, okay. you know about Brisson, you know. Because uh, yeah. you studied painting. In, you studied painting or you studied graphic design? I know no, you were no, a graphic designer. I know. I didn't really study. They didn't teach graphic design. They taught Paul Clay, and I already knew Paul Clay. No, but the thing is that I I think if you have a, a kind of curiosity and energy in the arts, then you, you, you don't have to go to school. You know these things just out of your own curiosity. And I always tell students that if you leave this school asking fewer questions than when you arrived, well, then you didn't get an education. It's all about schools have to teach you something. They teach you rules and then you have to unlearn all the rules. That's why I was lucky. I had to learn all the photos, photo rules, but I know everything. I mean, I didn't know everything, but I was, I was hip. I was cool. You know, I was, I knew all these people just out of. You still you know, are, you still are. Yeah, I'm very, I'm, I, what, what, why, what have you heard about my hips? Just, just <laughs> tell her about my hips. Oh, but I do want to get to these. Um, yeah, well, I did, I did a project called Empty New York. I was inspired by At J. And this particular, and I went around for, I don't know, at least a year photographing the city early in the morning. But this particular barbershop was particularly important because if you look in the back, you'll see there's a mirror and then there's a coat rack with these little white jackets. And I remember looking at that white jacket and I thought, well, the barber comes in, he puts on his white coat and then he does his barber act all day long. He cuts hair and makes a lot, talks a lot. And, and then I thought, well, this is his set. This is where he does his barber act and this is his theater. And this was the first inkling of uh, my affection and my interest in theater and viewing everything as theater. But this led me to doing sequences. This was sequ This was in my mind, you know, just from observing things, but it was a key to realize this was a stage set. And then everything looks like a stage set to me. Yeah, that's how you think. But I noticed in this picture too, that this was also the reflections that you use so, so well that you see your, we see you twice. Yeah. And then we also see you in that framed portrait of JFK that's sitting on the shelf there, which I love. Do you see it? Yeah. I didn't. Re I didn't realize. I yeah. But you know, I find that strange Martian who was in the room at the time. That's a see that with the big mouth and the round head. That's a Martian, and I didn't realize it was a Martian until he breathed Martian farts on me. And Martian farts are unbelievably disgusting. That's a Martian, in case anybody wants to know. Are they his, green? His name was Ronnie. Ronnie the Martian. Ronnie? Yeah. That's my mother's name. Your, mar <laughs> your mother's a Martian? She must be. <laughs> oh, I hope she has I came from then. her. We should introduce them. <laughs> I think she's on, actually. Um, and, so <laughs> and here's another one from... Another set. This is just a, you know, a cheap, cheap uh, uh, you know, where you go get cheap hamburgers and you know, pick up cheap people. <laughs> <laughs> so is this uh, place still in existence? I have is no idea. They no wouldn't clue. let me back in because I exposed myself <laughs> in that restaurant. I'm not talking about film now. <laughs> See, I think that's funny. Keep up, keep up, come on. I'm trying, I'm trying. It's hard to keep up with you. All right, so this is chance meeting. Yes. Was this one of the first sort of yeah, or one is this just one of your ones. favorites? This was in my first book. And you see, I think photography should not be about other people's realities. 
don't tell me what I already know. And I can only offer you my own mind, my own goofiness, my own whatever. And, and people are always photographing other people, something that they, 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 they don't know anything about. And this is, I thought this was very interesting. It has number interpretations. It's also a gay cruise. Two men walk down the street past each other and one checks one out. And then after the other one leaves, they, but it's all about ships in the night. It's all about those slight encounters. But I made this into theater. I made this into drama. This is a drama. Our lives are dramas. We don't see them that way, but they are. And that's yeah. Ted Bidlow looking back, a great old friend of mine. He was in a lot of early work. And that other guy was, I think his name was Barry, Barry Kaplan. And he was an early, really good photographer. And he had a huge spread on Life magazine. And his, he never went anywhere. And it's because if Lieberman didn't discover you, then you didn't exist. But Barry was a great photographer. So I was going to ask you that you sort of answer one of my questions to, to, you usually use people that you know or like in yeah. your in your sequences in your films or photographs. Yeah, I, I'm looking for a model now and I feel very embarrassed to go up to some a stranger and say, you know, you you <laughs> really have, to have your picture taken, you know, that's that's surprising. I never did develop the ability to. Uh, pick up people on the street in a nice way. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you can quote me on that. On that, see, he looks back. I love this moment. This is the denouement. This is the my Shakespearean ships in the night. And interestingly enough, these pictures have a large resonance. You know, this, this piece of work is uh, in Europe, you know, the, it's very, I mean, people all over the world respond to this. This has been seen in Japan and people understand this moment. Yes, absolutely. And it, so you you use people that you know in the photographs, but are you walking around location scouting or you find the location first? Like in this instance, did you, no, no, you had it I in have, your mind? When I have a need for a location, then I find one. I'm going back to McKeesport next week, next weekend, I'm making a little movie there and I've already have in my mind, and I'm like I'm going to photograph in the library and on the bridge. So the the, the location is very very important. The the maison scène very yes. important. Yes, your theater set, your set, so to speak. So I know you love this one as well. Oh, I love it. Yeah, who wouldn't? Uh, I was I got it's a long story, but I ended up getting a great assignment from De Noël, the French publisher. Well, I'll tell you how it happened. I was in Paris and on, I went to Cafe Floor and on to have morning coffee on Sunday. And there was Jean-Louis Chef, a great French photographer. And he said, what a coincidence, because I was trying to find you. I'm editing a series of books for De Noël. And we're asking six photographers, where would you like to go that you've never been? And he said, then you go there, you do a book, and then you write 60 pages of text and we'll publish anything you do. And he said, where do you want to go? And I immediately said, Egypt. And when I got to Egypt, I had a wonderful adventure. And when I was a little boy, I built my own, I used to build model cities and I always, I still do in a funny way. And uh, so when I go to the checkout counter at a &P, I line up all my boxes like skyscrapers. And so it was very natural for me to build my own pyramid. I love the audacity of it. That takes a lot of chutzpah. Today's Yom Kippur, incidentally. So I did, a, uh, I just think it gives me a tickle, you know? Yeah, it's great. What a great question and assignment. I have to ask you the same question now. If someone said that to you, where would you like to go that you've never been? Is there some place you've still never been that you'd want to go? Well, there are a couple of bedrooms I'd like to go to, but I haven't <laughs> been invited. But no, I don't want to go anywhere. I've I've done enough traveling. I'm over. You have. You've yeah. been everywhere. Yeah, I, I, I have, I've done everything. I, you know, Russia. I'm everywhere. Not everywhere, but mostly everywhere. Almost everywhere. Kind of everywhere. Sort of everywhere. And if you notice at the very end that. The last picture, my my pyramid's bigger than theirs, and uh, anyway, and I'm I'm going to shut up before I get arrested for indecent 
implosion and decent something. Decent it's one. a very good pyramid. Okay. Oh, you see, it makes an X too. Do you notice the X that makes the two pyramids? The three of them actually, the two, theirs and mine. I see it now, yes. That's great. You always have a great sense of design. You started out as a de designer. Well, yeah, but you know, I already, yeah, yeah, I did. I, I was a good graphic designer. I wasn't a great one. Uh, uh, Maybe that's because you left Parsons. <laughs> just in the nick of time. Oh, this is a wonderful design. Another one. I had a call from French Vogue years ago, and they used to do every December issue. They would have Hockney, a whole issue on drawing and, and Scorsese on film, and they were doing an issue on uh, quantum. And I've always been interested in the way the universe functions. And so uh, I, I did, this is Heisenberg's Magic Mirror of Uncertainty. And the idea is Heisenberg said that when you get to the very bottom, quarks and larks and parts and hearts and parts, uh, you get all this, this, uh, these particles in actions. Now they call them strings too. And the thing is you could never predict with any certainty the position or velocity of a particle. So my idea, this is, this is when you look in Heisenberg's magic mirror, you can continue. Every time she looks in a mirror, uh, the picture changes. Do we have the whole series? Yeah, you see? So she affects the image in the mirror by looking at it, and that's also quantum. Odette can never be sure of, with any certainty what reflection of herself she will see in the mirror. And go on. And then the act of looking in the mirror affects what the image will, she will see. And then, and then in the end, it says one more. Uncertainty permits the possibility of everything and anything. That is so terrific, even if I say so myself. Okay, I'll say it again, that's terrific. It is terrific. And I, I've noticed you use in the exhibition that we have at the low, the portraitist, there's a few images where you're using the mirror. Yes, um, yeah. With I'm Burt Reynolds. Betty. I found that mirror, I was in Bath once, in England, not my bathtub, and I, found that mirror in an antique store in a window and I brought it back on the plane with me. Can you imagine? Oh my goodness. I'm sitting practically next to this giant mirror. <laughs> I thought it was funny. That was funny. Yeah. So this was an assignment. I never knew that. Yeah, this was part of assignment. Uh, my, my assignments, and I've done everything commercially too, really, uh, including, uh, well, you'll see life covers and Paris, uh, Vogue, uh, Paris collections and New York collection. I mean, really, it's quite interesting. When did you stop taking assignments? I've heard you say in the past that you love doing them, but you I know stop. when they stopped asking me, I think a lot of people think I'm dead. So that's why they don't ask me, but I would come back from the grave for a good assignment. Ooh, I'm <laughs> what would be a good assignment to you these days? I don't know. I, I don't know, I'll know it when I see it. Something that I have to figure it out. Something that I have to invent something, not just taking headshots, you know, against no seam. I, I hate no seam. Well, this is called Grandpa Goes to Heaven. I've done a lot of things on the concept of death. And this is Lyman White. He's a great guy. He's a farmer up there. And that's in here. Fred and I lived in Cambridge, New York, four hours right on the border with Vermont for years. We didn't want Fire Island or the Hamptons. We wanted the woods and it was really quite extraordinary. I did a lot of work up there. So this is what I think happens when you die. Next. Sorry, I'm getting there. <laughs> I, I love do, that one. I do too. This is very one of my more popular items about death. In the first book I did, sequences, I did Death Comes to the Old Lady, uh, Spirit Leaves the Body, and then I turned the man into a, into a the star in, in, in the cosmos. So my questions, my photographs are about questions. They're not descriptions of something. This didn't really happen. This is pure fiction. It's, it's like poetry, writing, and anything that I have to figure out how to illustrate my imagination, how to make my mind appear in front of me. And that's a great power. 
if you could think of something and then look, there it is. Anyway, next. So what? what so when did you always think about death? Because your assignments are. Um... Oh, well, the, the, as I said, the very first book I did those three sequences about life after death and about the, the transcendental experience as it as it is as, I, as told to me. Yeah, I so I I know that you have um, a very tumultuous relationship with religion, but now. No, no, um, no. I dislike religion. Yeah. I'm but I've heard a, that you like sort of um, Eastern religions. Like oh yeah, Buddhism. Well, I like anything that engages the mind. Most most religions are political organizations only designed to perpetuate themselves by teaching people's rule. But if there's no heaven and no, they, they sell heaven and hell, they dangle heaven and hell in front of you. But if there's no heaven and no hell, then what's what is this? You know, it's a, it, it's anyway. So is no, that when you no, started? I could do I could do an hour on religion. Yeah, but I'm just wondering if that's when you when you started imagining what death would look like um, no, when you were a child. No, the second book I did was uh, the journey of the spirit after death after sequences and that was based on Tibetan Book of the Dead. When I left high school, my my first book I ever bought when I was 15 with my own money was Walt Whitman's Lead the Grass. And the second book at 17 was uh, Evelyn Underhill's book called Mysticism. I don't know what the hell they were talking about. I never heard of any of this. I was completely uh, marinated in Catholicism. Uh, churches don't want you to ask questions. And photographers are never taught to ask questions. They're taught to show me something they, that they encountered on the road, something they know nothing about. The only truth is your own truth. I can tell you nothing about anybody else's truth except mine. Yeah, I watched this um, video interview from uh, the 80s that you did at the New School for Social Research with Barbara Lee Diamondson. Well, yeah, she was terrific. And she said, you had said in it that you pay attention to your mind yeah. and that most people don't pay attention to their minds. And that we're all distracted by the noise of the culture that we live totally. around. We're all, we're all brainwashed, we're all so, we are consumers. The culture designs us to be consumers, not to think. I mean, if we thought we wouldn't do anything, that, that's why the, our education system is going down the tubes. Do you know the kids today don't know how to use, write cursive writing? Are you crazy? We were doing a shooting and we were so happy because we had this young guy and it occurred to me, I hope he knows how to write. And he did know how to write. We became civilized when we began to write. You know, now we're using our little finger. Yeah, we use the swipe. I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> so this is the iconic favorite of a lot of people. Yeah, and, and with good reason. That's one yeah. of my favorites, too. I was walking down 19th Street, a couple blocks over. I, I looked in a window, and I saw this little bath bathtub. It turns out it was a, this guy, it was a, fire extinguisher store but his, the owner's father was a plumber and this was his father's uh display plumbing display i thought it was so amazing that you know now a, a photographer if it saw it would maybe take a picture of it but for me this was a point of departure yeah that's an interesting picture but it becomes great great when you do the whole the story and I invented it. Then I had to go back after I photographed the guy in the mirror to get back. And I was afraid he wouldn't let me in. <laughs> I was willing even to pay him, you know, 10 bucks, who knows? That was a lot of money then. No, this I didn't is realize. I thought that you created this um, set. No, I didn't no, know I you found it. it. I found it. Reportage paid off. Yeah, and this always people, all, everywhere people respond to this because it's it's a riddle. It's a visual riddle, and it it uh, you know it doesn't it doesn't spill the beans, and it could go backwards or forwards. You know, it, you could start in the middle of it and do the you know, yeah. Yeah, I'll play it for everyone now. Yeah, it's a riddle, and that's Sean Kiernan. He's a friend of mine. Was a photographer, and uh, that's his big foot. And whose thumb is that? Oh, that's a friend of mine named Bill Burdick. He was another friend of mine. It was very important to be Dan Anton. That was his friend. And then I had to go take that picture and then frame it and then go back. You see how dirty the sink was? 
the guy wouldn't let me he wouldn't let me touch it so i couldn't clean it or blow the you know blow the man down were you going to i think the dirt on the sink adds so much to it well no well now it does yeah but in those days it was just dirt <laughs> that's All great right. okay oh i have to tell you i'm my biggest fan People you should be yeah, people <laughs> photograph nudes all the time. But what I did was, you know, I call this the most beautiful part of a man's body. I think it must be there where the torso sits on and into the hips, those twin de delineating curves, feminine and grace, girdling the trunk, guiding the eye downwards to their intersection, the point of pleasure. Then I did the most beautiful part of a woman's body neck. In the oldest dreams of old men, women's breasts still remain long after their desires have turned to dust. They are their first mem memories, a warm, nurturing home, the point of satisfaction, perfect in their gracious arcs, women wear their breasts as medals. So I annotated. Now, language has always gone with uh, photographs. You pick up a the front page of the New York Times and it says Donald Trump falls down a flight of steps and breaks his hair, you know. And then there's a, you see him. So captions tell you what you're looking at. I tell you what you cannot see. I I, I elaborate the the communication. I enhance it. I enrich it. I I you become you become the artist. It's one thing to photograph something, but when you uh, uh, annotate it. When you uh, express, you give it a voice, you give the photograph a voice, you give the experience of sharing something with somebody else a voice by adding this. And of course, then you could, I could fail not only as a bad photographer, but I could also fail as a bad writer. All well, I consider you like a poet. Um, I know you've had books published of your writings, but I, do you think of yourself as a poet? I mean, they're poems to me. Um, on the photograph. Well, they are, they are. And no, yeah, I, I call myself an expressionist. It's not about photography or writing or, or the idea. It's how well do you express yourself? And this one's again about death. All things mellow in the mind, a sleight of hand, a trick of time, and even our great love will fade. Soon we'll be strangers in the grave. That's why this moment is so dear. I kiss your lips and we are here. So let's hold tight and touch and feel for this quick instant we are real. It's true. It is true. It's beautiful. And I love how you, you know, cross things out. So are you are you thinking out what you're gonna say before you write on it or you're thinking oh, it out? No, out? no, I always think it out. I don't I you know, but I make mistakes. And uh, see what I wrote? I wrote all things mellow. L E L L O W I N. I think in. it was just too close, I, right? I ran, I, yeah, but I ran them together like one word, right. mellow in became mellow in. And that's why I, I love mistakes. I don't want perfection. Stay away from perfection. Uh, am I not flawed, Josiah? He'll tell you, I'm very flawed. And you don't want to be perfect because you could get trapped in perfection, you know, and you learn from your mistakes if you're smart. And this, the New York Times asked five photographers to do self portraits for the magazine. And I did the back of my head, you don't see my face. And I wrote, I think about thinking because what's interesting about me is not my nose or, you know, or, or my double chin. What's interesting is my imagination. Very my true. Imagination. And that, so that's my self portrait. In the portrait, you don't have to see the, the, the person's face. And that's what you call the prose portrait, right? Yes, that's the prose portrait. That's right. I, I, I don't want to run out of time because I have a lot of work to show. And yeah. I want to make sure you see the, how's our time? We're doing good. We have a whole ha 26 minutes. So I think yeah. I'm already on. Um, well, don't forget to save movie time. I'm, I'm saving time. Don't worry. Okay. And I've written a lot about uh, my father. And this says, my father could walk in the sky. He promised to show me how, or should say he promised to teach me how. 
but he left without saying goodbye. I don't cry. I'm a grown up now. So people have complicated, not me, but almost everybody, some sort of complicated relationship with, with uh, their parents. And uh, so rather than showing you a, a, what my father looked like, I, I gave you what did not occur between us. And this is a great model, my, my great model of mine named Billy. And his mother saw the picture. She said, that's Billy because he has flat feet. And she <laughs> recognizes from his feet. That of course is a double exposure. He was not in the sky, contrary to popular belief. And you do all these double exposures, I have to ask, because we've had a lot of um, University of Miami students coming in to see the exhibition in the museum. And they all want to know the double exposures are done in camera, correct? They're all done in, they're, they're in the negative. And I saw my first double exposure when I went to Russia. I, I did, did a picture accidentally and uh, I thought that looked terrific. So everybody would consider it a mistake. I didn't. The question is, where does it take you? Well, this is about being gay. It's called the unfortunate man. The unfortunate man could not touch the one he loved. It had be, been declared illegal by the law, the church, the law. Slowly his fingers became toes and his hands gradually became feet. And he began to wear shoes on his hands to disguise his pain. It never occurred to him to break the law. And it's really, really annoys me. I'm gonna give you my gay lecture whether you like it or not. Here's, here it is. Gayness, homosexuality as told to Duane and by Duane. Everything in nature is abundant, done in abundance and variation. Nature makes 50,000 kinds of beetles, 40,000 kinds of butterflies. And in the human spectrum, nature makes some people are white, some people are brown, some people have gray hair, some people have yellow hair. And this, in the sec, it's all a spectrum. And in the sexual spectrum, some people are 100% straight, some people are 50% gay. It's, a, it's, it's a, a variation in the spectrum. I am 100% gay. But some people get married, you know, it's a variation. And you don't burn people at the stake because they have red hair. Maybe you do. Actually, the church used to burn you if you, and not just burn your ass, they would really burn you all over. But for, you know, so for God's sakes, gay is just like straight, except it's different. And the difference is that it's the same love, the same affection, the same wanting to, wanting to hug, wanting to touch. And it's, and it's as natural as straight. Yes. And thank you for talking about this from very early on in your career. You've been, this has been a subject of your work for a long time and, you know, Everyone's talking about it now, but you were doing it before everyone else was. When, so when they, really when they could that. really hurt you. <laughs> you know, I'm not a fan of Maplethorpe. I'm not a fan of all these professional things. That's, you know, I just, I want to know what something feels like. You know, I know what a dick looks like. I know what tits look like. Yeah, boo, boo hoo, get over it. And anyway, this is called, this was in my first book, Death Comes the Old Lady, and that's my grandmother. Oh, and, I and, didn't know that. Yeah. And she had Alzheimer's. Okay, Nick, and that's my dad dressed up as Mr. Death, and okay, and he comes. But you know, now if I would have if I would reshoot this, I would come in on the hand touching her on the shoulder. My he should have been blurred. I got that, and I wanted. That's the moment that she died. Oh, I when we get through with this, I have I have something interesting on the same subject to show you. And then I asked her to get up very slowly because this is exactly what I wanted. I wanted her to start blurring into her particles. It's like a Heisenberg's theory of uncertainty. These are the, we're, we're, we're a bunch of jumping particles and those are the particles blowing up into the universe. That's so great. That's so great. Yeah. Anyway, there you are, next. Oh, and this is my cousin Kenny and his bride Phyllis. And this is after they got married. They were visiting my grandmother's house. And I, th this is my idea of their wedding picture. And normally it's, you know, the guy and a woman standing next to each other, blah, blah, blah. But this is, uh, well, you know, what else says blah, blah, blah. There's a wonderful guy named Keith Madden. You, you should look him up on YouTube. YouTube, is that YouTube? Uh, that he talks about nothing and something. I insist, I demand that you 
Look, Keith Madden. Okay, the, we'll look him up, everybody. <laughs> and the guy named Parsons. Same concept, very interesting idea. And then I wrote, you see, that's one picture. Then uh, later I wrote, this photograph is my proof. There was that afternoon when things were still good between, between us and she embraced me and we were so happy. It had happened. She did love me. Look, for, see for yourself. And long after, you know, not them, but people split, you still have that photograph that was taken, you know, like this picture when I was in the army in, in tanks in 1953. You know, that moment that doesn't exist is still there. That's the great magic of photography. It is really. Have to be forgotten that's still there, that nanosecond of an um, instant. I love the crack in the wall that sort of leads to them. Was that that's interesting? Very, that's very rude of you to point out our poverty. That wasn't <laughs> a crack, that was a lightning bolt about to strike them. That was Zeus's lightning bolt striking them with love. That, thank you for, I remember that, so I don't forget. That, that crack is, very interesting you picked that up. Most people don't see that, including me. Thank you. <laughs> well, I get credit for that uh, no. annotation. <laughs> well, this is another gay picture. And it says when he was a young man, he could not imagine being old. And now that he's old, he can't imagine ever having been young. It's the classic situation where a, an old older person living alone, an older gay guy living alone, very much like a Kafafi poem. And I love the cat. And the cat has an erection. Isn't that amazing? And that's the subterfuge. That's a subplot most people don't get. And the cat's name was Ronnie. No, it wasn't Ronnie. But I love him looking at himself as a young man. Think Great. about that. That's, think what, they, what that's saying. You know, it's not just an old person in an old folks home looking at you. This is about the very nature of what it is to be old. Next. Oh, then I went back to McKeesport. No, the New Yorker, here's a job. The New Yorker sent me to do a portrait of uh, Larry Kramer in Pittsburgh. And I said to my assistant, Ray, let's go see my old house in McKeesport. And McKeesport had fallen on bad times. And I went back again and rephotographed it. So this is looking out of my, the house was abandoned. This is looking out of my window. As a child, I did not understand that I was a prince and that my father was the king. And although we did not live in a castle and father worked in the mill, I began to realize in the realm of my dreams that I was the Dauphin. And through my bedroom window, I could see a spectacle of turrets and minarets float above the soiled city below like an iridescent mist. My imagination would be both my wand and my scepter and there would be no boundaries to my domain. Now, if I showed you that picture, that's without the text, that's one thing. But this tells you about the magic. This is about math. Do you believe in magic? Next. I before I, before magic. I move on, I just wanted to ask you because I've, you know, it's like you use your camera as a journal um, and then you're writing on them. But do you write in a journal? Oh, yes, I have. I have lots of journals. I write every day almost. You write every day. That was my I, question. I write as much as I take. In fact, I write more now than I take pictures. And it's all about expression again. Um, I love doing portraits. And this is Joseph Cornell. He was a real nut job, a genius nut job, weirdo, strange guy, fruitcake. Did I get hit them all? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love this photograph. Did you? I do too. We, there yeah. are a lot of um, artist portraits that you've taken over yeah, the years. I How did this one come about? Well, I, I had been visiting him. He would, did I tell you he was a nut job? He, he did. When I went, <laughs> Uh, we we would have a cup of a cup of tea, and then he had a kitchen. He lived on Utopia Parkway. Can you imagine an old little row house? And you went into this. The kitchen was built in 1930, and nothing had changed. So he always made a cup. Of, and he used to wear what looked to me to be like a woman's angora sweater. It was all fluffy. And he would he would turn on the gas, and the, the heat water, and the, the flame would shoot up. You know. And I thought I should get my camera in case. I could get a portrait of a flaming Joseph Cornell, a flaming Cornell, that would have been something. And then I would have peed on him to put him out, of course. But uh, it was amazing, amazing man, a pure, true surrealist. He was the real thing. So was this a really, uh, did he, did you 
have him move slowly here or it yes, was just you, you, he had to move so what happened was when you work against a uh, bright white light like an illuminated man the, the camera does and you expose for the room you get these interesting effects and i love it and also he looks like a giacometti figure too it does yeah. yeah oh it was my oh this is an interesting assignment when i was first starting out i was hired to do this young woman named barbara streisand that was she was in her first play i had never heard of her Recording what's that is that me is that a comment? Oh, it's Barbara. <laughs> it must be. Voiceover. So she, in. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, so she came and brought a, two suitcases full of old clothes. And we just, and I was experimenting with this, this large, I hate this camera. I hate that size. I love the negative. I love, I love digital. Fuck film, I say. I love digital. Anybody who is so things feel so you try working with film if you're doing something really difficult and we got along so well I said Barbara I never I don't I've never heard you sing so she said I'm going to be on Gary Moore's show come up to my agent and I'll show you a clip so I went I met her at her agent and she sang happy days are here again and I said that's sensational I, I mean you are really great Whatever happened to her, Sasai? Do you remember? Barbara who? What was her name? Barbara. She's still around. <laughs> she even misspelled her first name. Oh, and this is Maya Angelou. I and, love this one. Yeah, I do too. And I love it particularly because she's behind this white barrier. She's seeing through the white, the whiteness of our, you know. You know. So did you come up with that together or did you ask her just- No, to no, 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 no. People, when you take a picture, they don't know what you're doing. Really, they don't know what you're doing, unless well, you tell them to do something. No, what do they know? No, of course I put. It's you a really amazing photograph. More, you asked me that question once more, and I'm going to fart all over your camera. <laughs> Will it be an uh, an alien fart though? Yeah. Oh, and this is uh, what was that? The great a uh, uh, Japanese director. I forgot his name. The Kurosawa oh, was it mm -hmm. Kurosawa? Yeah, and. I used to have like a half an hour to photograph somebody. So I had to be quick on, and we were, we went into Central Park and I love that tent. I love that grimace and I like the pattern. I'm very fond of Hokusai and Hiroshige, all the Jap, I love Jap, I did Japanese fan photographs. I don't know if we want to show them anyway. No, we don't I, have any, unfortunately, but I've seen them. <laughs> yeah, but did I capture anything? No. Please, you capture it in nonsense. How could you capture any? I don't even know. This is a 1932 model. This is a red a body. They're recalling my year. I don't even. I don't, I'm. I'm inside here doing this. All right, let's let's move on. Toshiro Mufumi. Toshiro Mufumi. Yeah, I'm sorry. I lied. This is Andy Ho Ho Warhol. Uh, I'm not. I knew Andy I, at the beginning of his career. I'm not an Andy fan. Uh, don't get me going on Andy. Andy was not really a, a, a painter or any, he was a skimmer. He skimmed the culture. He did not create anything. He got famous people's pictures and then regurgitated them and made them very large. And Gerard Malanga did all the work. Andy didn't do any of that. Andy is a social phenomenon, but uh, Andy was a big phony, not in a nice way. So you he have a couple of um, photos uh, that you took of, uh I can't remember who the other person is, but you did it in the same format. So did you, you yeah. did this though what in the dark room, do? right? I did Jasper Johns this way too. Yeah, it was Jasper Johns. Yeah, this is a big deal. This is a- So it looks know. like you you took all the photos and then in the dark room, you printed it like almost like a contact sheet, right? Yeah, that's what it is. It's like a, a flip, it's yeah. a flip, it's a, a 360. Flip face. <laughs> it's called a flip face. It's a new art category, yeah. You know, when I first met Andy, I didn't know he had fake hair. I thought that was his real hair. I thought he just looked strange. Never occurred to me. There I was losing my hair. And I, this is Tom Waits posing. A, you know, the minute you pick up the camera, he did his, that's his look. You know, you put the camera down, he does this. You pick it up, he does this. Yeah. Done, done. yeah. A lot of that's these celebrities, one. that's shtick. And I did, this is a uh, cover I did for, I did a lot of record album covers. I did the Sting and the Police and... Carly Simon and uh, it's fun. So I had to take him here, then I photographed him many times and then I pasted it up and put it together. Great. 
Oh, and this is from my record with Sting. I love this is Andy Summers as a butterfly. That was a really great assignment. It was so funny. I went, I had to go to LA to meet them. And I was driving to, uh, uh, <laughs> it's a and I almost said s and m studio. But that was another <laughs> shooting. <laughs> that was and, a different story. And then I heard this music. So when I met Sting, I said to him, I, I, he said, I didn't know his music. So I said, um, uh, do you have a big hit now? And he said, yes, I do. And I said, I think I might have heard it. It was really nice. It was on the radio. I heard it a couple of times. It was called, Do You Really Want to Hurt Me? And that was Boy George, which I didn't know at the time. So it was very embarrassing to be introduced to Sting. And then, never mind. You had, you had to be there. Next. That's great. <laughs> Oh, and this is interesting. This was at the end of Eartha Kitt's life. And I, and I loved her. And I went, to, I photographed her backstage on a matinee. She was exhausted. And, you know, you try to engage somebody, but she, she didn't say anything. And then I told her that when I was in the army in Germany, I named my tank. We had a name our Ceci Bon. After we were Charlie company. So your tank had to be, had, and, uh, and that was the name. So let me go, go back, go back, go back. Sorry, did so, it on its own. <laughs> no, and then, so as I was leaving, she, she turned and she said to me, whatever became of your tank? And I said, it blew up. That was, a, it didn't blow up, but I, I made a good story. So I, it blew up and she looked even, that's how exhausted she was. I don't know how she went on to do a whole per performance that night. What a woman, what a woman. It's a great photo. Yeah. Oh, and this is interesting. This is my great friend, uh, Dave Coulter. He was my assistant. He lives in the poke in the nose. And when I did his portrait, I thought, why not? Why don't we just photograph their face? Why don't you? I painted in his heart. I painted it. I painted all the, the blood vessels. I thought that was, and there's the cycle of the moon. I love the idea of uh, painting. You know, like it'd be great to photograph somebody when they're dead and then photograph their insides as well. Why is that not Dave as well as, as his nose? Yeah, I love the painted photographs. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> when did you start painting on the photographs? Oh, in, in the 80s. I thought that if you can, you know, if, if you could write, why not paint on the photograph? You know, so I began to look at the photograph and I have a small talent for painting. And I think if you have any talent at all, you should investigate it. And this is, uh, oh, that first one was my portrait of uh, James Joyce. I love James Joyce. I did a movie about him. You should see my James Joyce movie. And then it's an, an, it's an old tintype, but you have to get big ones. And the thing about it is I like the idea that I brought this old photograph back to life. It, it's in photographic history doing Tin types, and that's he looks like a mechanical man. That was the Ulysses movie, right? Yes, I that saw was it. It was yeah, great. This, <laughs> yeah, this is my and this is my portrait of Fred, and I love I love all the colors, and I like the energy, and I like the I like the curiosity, and you know you have to look at this and look at it for a while. You know, it's not you look at it. Oh yeah, that's Fred's face. Okay, you know this is more about energy all of its personalities and moods, yes. right? Multi-level, layered, yeah. Next. Oh, this is some of my commercial work. This is a life cover I did. I did three life covers and uh, I wrote the title and I did a, what's that called? Solarization. Um, I've done everything in photography. I haven't done porn. Not that I haven't wanted to, but I've never been asked. And people, they all leave. The, oh, this is a recent portrait I did of the late Chuck Close. No, may I rest That's in Chuck peace. Chuck Close and Chuck Farr. Everybody cracks up when I'm sitting in the in my office um, at my desk in the museum, and I hear people going through, and I hear them laugh. I know where they are. <laughs> They're looking at this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, this is Tilda Swinton, my, what my great heroes. She is sensational. And I love this because she's a wonderful actress. And I love this because it's such a surreal port. I don't like the word surreal, but you know, to photograph the back of her head and then to see her in the mirror, you know, 
that's even better. It's a double bonus. And I like, I, that's my favorite surreal suit. I have to rent it. They will never sell it to me. And I love that suit. And if you wear big floppy shoes, it makes you look like a clown. Okay, this is a, Josiah, I have to give Josiah credit. None of these movies are possible without him. He edits and does all the computer stuff. We've done about 30, over 30 films and little films. I have no ambition to Hollywood, but although if somebody would offer me a million bucks to make a movie, I'd do it. And uh, so this is a, one of my favorites. It's surreal nonsense, York. All right, so I'm gonna stop share this and then share the actual film for a moment. Just give me one second. And everyone, if you continue to type in some questions that you have for Mr. Michaels, I see a few there. This film is about seven minutes, a little less, right? And somehow I've lost it on my screen, but we will, here it is. We will take your questions after, so you can hang with us. We appreciate that. Okay. Sorry, I'm getting it now. Here I go.
Well, that was great. Thank you. I guess we don't have time for the other one. Um, no, probably not. But I'd we can ask questions. questions and then yeah. for anyone that um, wants to see it, you should go to Vimeo and if you put in Dwayne Michaels, you put in the end, which is, is the other one we were going to show. You can watch it. It's there. And there are many other films that you can see and the, the Ulysses one as well, which he mentioned before. Okay, so how do we do the questions? So we have some, I'm just gonna read them off to you. We have okay. some questions okay. that people have asked. Um, so Kai wants to know, um, do you have a favorite type of camera or does it depend on what you're capturing? No, 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 I'm not a camera nut, but Josiah, we just informed we use the Canon 5D and uh, I love uh, digital. You know, I'm, I, I'm very bad on, I'm typical people in my generation, you know, I know nothing about the computer, I'm totally illiterate, but the things we can do, the freedom, it would kill me early on in a dark room trying to make something happen, you know, and then waiting a day to find this, and, you know, it's, I know, I love, I love digital. Um, great. So um, Evie says, hi, Dwayne, my name is Evie. I'm a huge fan and you're one of my largest inspirations as a photographer. What pressures have you felt being amongst the first surrealist photographers in the art form? None, none at all. My own, my own pressures. I, I don't care. Listen, if I was worried at the beginning about Tsiolkovsky's opinion, you know, I never would have done what I've done. Uh, at the first exhibit I had with sequences, Gary Winogrand came in and he looked around and said, what is this? This isn't photography. And I wanted to know this isn't your photography, you know. No, no, I, Couldn't I, be more different than Gary Winogrand, right? Entirely, entirely, yeah. No, I, uh, I have enough confidence, I, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm my biggest fan. I can't wait to see what I'm going to do next. Um, Kathy wants to know, would you like to go into space to photograph? No. I think that was in response to when I was asking you about where would you want to go today if you were given any location. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, theoretically, I suppose so if I could take my models and create people flying around space, you know, but I'd have to take my own models, I'd have to take my own props into space with me. I wouldn't relate, relate just to stars. Somebody wanted to know, did the idea of the butterfly being being symbolic of rebirth after death play a role in the photos with Andy Summers? No. So what can you tell us more about that? Well, I love insects. I have insects. I have a lot of butterflies. I used to have a lot of stuffed animals. I did an exhibit in the country. It's called an exhibit in the woods for, only, for animals only, not for people. So I put 16 by 20 print in the forest and then I have all these stuffed animals looking at the print. So it's for animals, it's not a, for human audience. Thank you. Um, somebody wanted to know how long did it take you to make your, the film and the others, I guess. It must take a lot longer. No, not that long. We shot it, what, a week? Well, well, but we shot it in a day or two days. That one was about a week, yeah. That was a few days. Oh, we went, that one, that was yeah. complicated. We had to go back to do some, we yeah. shot that in Central Park, you know. Oh, but I imagine the editing takes a lot longer, right? Yeah, putting it together was, <laughs> uh, I always expect something to happen that I don't expect to happen. I like when I go to McKeesport, we wrote out a kind of a script, but I'm expecting things to happen that I'm not planning on. I like the accidents. So that sort of comes up to a question that one of the um, professors at UM asked me to ask you, actually, did you ever have a bad shoot that you didn't expect? No, I'm, I can't think of any ever that I, uh, I always manage to salvage something. Yeah, no, no. I, and you know, when you do commercial work, you can't do a bad shoot. And, I mean, I, I, you know, you do, in, when you're an artiste, you know, you can spill paint on your camera, which I've done too. And, uh, you know, that's, but if you're doing a job, you can't come in if the assignment was a camera without paint on it, you know, you, you don't get asked back. So right. it's, I admire commercial photographers because it's very difficult to do and there's so much competition and the whole photo world has changed enormously since I was a kid, especially now with uh, digital. I mean, it's completely different. Absolutely. And here's another question. Um, 
you've photographed so many famous people all over the world. Has anybody ever wowed you? Wowed me, sure. Yeah. In fact, there are a couple people that uh, that I was intimidated by. One of them was Robert Frank. And I met him a number of occasions. He's always nice to me. But I was just, I. there used to be a restaurant he went to and I went to and I went in there once and he was there with June. And he invited me to have dinner with him. And I said, no. What? <laughs> I know. I'm so, ow, ooh, ow, ow. No, because I was so intimidated. I'm very verbal. But sitting next to Robert Frank, I'd say, hi. No. And then I was intimidated by, uh, what's his name? Okay, come back to me. Uh, De Kirico, who was to be huge. And, and also by Saul Steinberg, who I thought was a genius. So okay. in, with all of them, I, I, I didn't function full capacity. When I photographed Robert Frank too, I just did a shot of him. I just, uh, would be- So related, uh, sorry, related to that, um, Evie wants to know how did you enjoy working with Marguerite? I think I know the answer Marguerite, to this question. Are you kidding? I was, luckily I didn't know enough about it because I would have been totally intimidated. Uh, no, it was wonderful. Can you imagine? We had lunch every day. Uh, it was extraordinary. He had a dinner and showed me home movies he made. He gave me the free run of the house. He was just oh, amazing. Amazing. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't fly back from uh, Brussels. I walked on water all the way back. I was so high. That's funny. You don't laugh. Why? I did. I got it. Sorry. I was, I'm reading the questions right. also. So right. <laughs> it's not that I'm it not. Was, it was a privilege and and he still thrills me. He's one of my great inspirations always. Yeah, that's amazing. And of course, those photographs you took of him are so iconic. Yeah, and at, I didn't, at the time, I didn't realize, uh, you know, what was going on. When I got back, talk, talk, I've always been lucky. I got back, and that fall, they were going to have a Magritte exhibit at MoMA, and they needed a picture for the cover of the catalog. Wow, how the amazing. Timing, yeah, yeah. Great timing. Um, Pat wants to know if you'll please tell us more about your upcoming McKeesport project. Well, yeah, I'm very excited about it. Who, you know, you can't go home again. Uh, and of course, it's fraught with problems. Uh, you know, I mean, there's always uh, issues to deal with. But and what what what's this movie going to be about? You know, what? I love the idea. At I'll be 90. I said, you know, and I like the idea at this age going back. I've never outgrown McKeesport in a way, and I've never outgrown my old neighborhood. And I'm going back to the library, I used to go to the library all the time. I'm going to shoot there. And I took a book out of the library when I was about seven or eight or something, nine times in a row, and they wouldn't let me have it anymore. And uh, who wanted that? It was called Cities of America. And that's when I was building model cities. Oh. And they had all the skylines of every city in America. And, yeah, I have a lot of eccentricities. You know, I'm going down on the bridge, and we're going to get a zoom. And at the end, I do a little monologue, and the, zoom, the camera will zoom above me and disappear. I a mean, drone. the whole, what? Get a drone. A drone. What did I say? Oh, you're going to do a drone. <laughs> it's going to happen. Yeah. Okay. So um, Veronica wants to know what artists influence you outside of photography. Oh, that's very easy. I love writers. I love. Uh, Joyce, of course. My go-to, when I run into a, a block, I always go to Rambo's Illuminations. I think it's wonderful writing, full of contradiction, full of non sequiturs. Uh, I also go to Beckett. I love Beckett's writing. And curiously or not, I love reading Shakespeare. Really? I'm, I'm da yeah, I'm dazzled by Shakespeare. There are, that, the genius is so beyond comprehension. Any know. favorite in particular of Shakespeare? I say, well, let me think. There are so many of them, it's hard to say, but there are so many random quotes, but, you know, f you know, from measure for measure to measure to measure. I, sh I should put that to words. And, you know, I mean, any of them, uh, it just breaks your heart how beautiful he is, you know. Did you know that Hamlet, the, the original title for Hamlet was, it was supposed to be a cookbook, and the original title for the play was Omelette. No. <laughs> I made that up. 
Um, speaking of sort of theater and plays and writers, is there, I'm wondering personally if you um, have a recent or the most recent one that you were able to go see, of what's your favorite play or oh, oh, movie? Well, I, I, I love reading biographies. I just got finished reading Tom Stoppard's biography and Gildersten and Rosencrantz. I mean, Tom Stoppard is right up there. He is an amazing genius. He's just, you know, when, when Diaghilev, when Cocteau was a young man and Diaghilev was the reigning impresario at the Ballet Russe in Paris in 1910 or whenever, Cocteau was going to collaborate with Diaghilev and and Cocteau, Diaghilev said, Cocteau said too many names, Cocteau, what do you expect? You know, what do you want? And Diaghilev said, astound me. And I want to be astounded. I don't want to be bored. Andy Warhol is fucking boring. Andy Warhol tells me what I already, oh, no kidding, that's Marilyn Monroe. Where have I seen that before? You, uh, astounding is where you go. You don't go for boredom. I'm not hip. I'm not cool. Uh, I'm not cruel. Uh, none of those things. I, I'm, I'm in so my I, days. Yeah, days. So in relation to that, I'm wondering, we asked a lot of the artists that we've spoken to over the past, you know, year and a half for this pandemic, virtually, you know, how was that for you? What did you do to keep? Oh, I didn't yourself? have any problem with it because every week I turned out a new thing. Josiah always said to me, we should go on the internet. And I said, why? Why bother? He said, because, you know, you could get your work out there. And for, uh, how many do you think we've done, Josiah? It's oh, over a year. Over a hundred, yeah. Wow. Every so week, it's been a really week. good time for you then. Every week. And they're all different. And they're dazzling. I dazzle me. <laughs> <laughs> so you dazzle us as well. So we went a little over time, which we really appreciate you doing, staying on with us for the extra time. Are you kidding? I love this. I really do. Well, yeah. we really appreciate it. It's been wonderful to talk to you and hear some of the behind the scenes of the photographs and the films. And everyone should really follow, I do follow you on Instagram at the Dwayne Michaels. There's another Dwayne Michaels, but the official one is the Dwayne Michaels. So you should follow. And look at Vimeo too. Yes, and go to Vimeo and watch all the movies, all the films, they're really wonderful. Okay. Now go do it, astound me. The better than that, astound yourself. If you're bored, that's your problem, not mine. Thank you so very much again. Bye. Have a great evening. I just did. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Can we go now? Oh, we're over here. <laughs> okay. Thank Bye. you so much. See you. Take care.